Okay, next we're going to learn how to apply Taylor series to a real problem. First of all, let's imagine you have a function, some function that uh, you'd like to find a polynomial approximation for. This particular function is called the Morse potential. It's a function of energy. I'm sorry, it is a function whose value is an energy, and it depends on position. It's really used to study molecular, I should say, atomic interactions in a molecule. Uh, how do you find a polynomial approximation to something like that? One answer is to use the Taylor series. A Taylor series is basically uh, a power series in the distance from some point of interest. In this case, we're interested in the equilibrium position. That's the point of lowest potential. We call that x0. And we want to know a power series in the distance from equilibrium that doesn't have very many terms, that represents the potential well enough that we can make some physical mm, calculations or some physical conclusions based on that. So a Taylor series looks like this. It's got uh, a function uh, with coefficients. There, there's a coefficient for each power of the separation. So there's the zero power of separation would be the coefficient a, and the first power of separation would be the coefficient b, and the second power of separation would be a coefficient c, and so on. The question is, what are the coefficients? Well, the way Taylor series answers that question is to first set the value of x to x0 and demand that the series matches the value of the function. Well, if you do that, you'll notice that the coefficients b, c, and d don't matter. All that matters is the coefficient a, and the coefficient a turns out to be nothing other than the value of the function at x0. So we have our first coefficient. How do we get b and c? Well, the Taylor series says that we want to match the first derivative of the function with the first derivative of the series exactly at the point x0. So we set x to x0, put that back into the derivative, and then notice again that c and d and so on can't go away because they're multiplied by 0. But b, because when you take the derivative, it no longer multiplies anything, becomes equal to the value of the first derivative. So we have another coefficient. b is now the value of the first derivative at x0. You do the same thing with the second derivative. This time, though, you don't get c equals the second derivative. You get c equals the value of the second derivative at x0 divided by 2. Now, where did that 2 come from? If you go back to the original power series, you'll notice that the 2 is the power of the separation. So c gets divided by 2 because it's a coefficient of the second power. If you do it again, then you get uh, the d coefficient. Well, the d coefficient turns out to be the value of the third derivative divided by 3 times 2. It's 3 times 2 because um, you get uh, a 3 from the third power, and then when you take the derivative again, you get a 2 from the second power and a 1 from the first power. So what you're really doing is dividing by 3 factorial. So the nth term is the nth derivative of the function evaluated at x0 divided by n factorial. And at the bottom of the page, you'll see the most economical version of that. Okay. Now, uh, let's go back and look at the Morse potential. This is the actual functional relationship of the Morse potential. Um, the question is, can we estimate the frequency of oscillation of a mass in that potential using the Taylor series? The answer is yes. We'll go to the Taylor series. Let's, uh, <clears throat> let's start with the real potential. And uh, what I'd like to do, first of all, let's put some numbers in for the uh, various parameters of the Morse potential. We use a, a potential minimum of quarter of an electron volt, an equilibrium separation of 1.12 angstroms, and the alpha coefficient, which is in some sense the, the steepness of the potential, will make that 5.6 per angstrom. And uh, what I want to point out is that there's a nice tool called Sage, which you can get for free, that makes it much easier to evaluate these terms in a complicated potential like this. So what do we need? We need the value, we need the first derivative, the second derivative, the third derivative, and so on. Well, taking derivatives of complicated exponentials isn't that bad, but it's a little tricky because, you know, things get multiplied together and so on. 
So I went ahead and uh, set up Stage on my laptop, and uh, you can download it at the URL given there, sagemath.org. And uh, when you run it, it, f it comes up with a Sage prompt, and you can type in a command. So the first command I typed in to get this thing going was var. Var declares the variables in your expression. And it spit back out the names of the variables that I chose, um, a for alpha, x0, and x. And it doesn't do the right arrow. I put that in to save space on the screen. So it, uh, it actually just prints out on the next line the, you, the names of the variables. Then I defined u to be uh, the expression that you see there. Notice it's just like Excel. It's very similar to Python, except that instead of double star for exponentiation, it uses up caret like Excel. So it's more like Excel. Um, when Sage comes back, I can ask it, what is the value of the function I just typed in, and specify the values of the variables that go into the function, and it comes back with minus 0.25. Well, that's good, because uh, um was 0.25. If you go back and look at the exponential, you'll see that's the right answer. Now, here's a trick. I can say, I want to define up to be the derivative of u with respect to x. It's a partial derivative, treating all the other parameters as constant. What happens if I take the derivative with respect to x? I get a new function called up, and it spits out this. Now, notice that's what you get if you went and did it yourself, but it does it for you. It takes care of all the chain rules and the product rules and whatever else goes on to, to evaluate the thing. You can even say, well, what happens if I stick x equal to x0 in up? And it comes back with the answer. The answer turns out to be 0. And the answer is independent of um, a, and, uh, well, um and a, I guess. I can do the same thing with u prime prime. Take the derivative and take the derivative again. And then I can say, and then it spits out this terrible monster, which, uh, which it does for me. And then I can ask, what's its value at x equals x0? And it puts x equal to x0 and evaluates and tells me in terms of a and um what it comes out to be. If I like, I can call that result specifying numbers for x0, a, and um, and it gives me the second derivative. It's 15.68. It's got to be 15.68 electron volts per square angstrom, I guess, since those are the units we're using. And you can do the same thing with u prime prime prime, and you'll get another monstrosity, and you can ask its value at x equals x zero, and you'll get a similar expression, and then you could ask what is it when x zero a and um have definite numerical values, and it'll give you a number for that. If you graph these things, uh, the real function here is the red curve, the constant term in the Taylor series is the purple curve, the quadratic term is the green curve, and the cubic is the blue curve. So let's look at that. There's the original curve. There's the constant curve. Now let's add in the quadratic, and we get the green. Then let's add in the cubic, and we get the blue. Now notice that every time I add another curve, I get a slightly more accurate representation of the function, but it's still not perfect. If I get far enough away from the equilibrium position, I need more terms in the Taylor series to get a perfect answer. But for small oscillations about the equilibrium position, I hope you can appreciate that the Taylor series gives me a good approximation in the neighborhood of the equilibrium position. Okay, let's go back and look at the original function and let's look at the Taylor series approximation. The first term is just a constant. Well, a constant doesn't matter to a potential energy because you can add or subtract a constant to every energy in the problem and it won't affect the physical solution. The second term is the derivative of the potential at the equilibrium position. But remember that the equilibrium position is the minimum of the potential. That means that the first derivative at that point is zero. So the first two terms don't matter. What about the third term? Well, it's one-half times a constant times the separation squared. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, that's Hooke's Law. Well, that's the energy associated with a Hooke's Law spring, one-half kx squared, or one-half ks squared, where s is the separation. 
And finally, the fourth term is the asymmetry term. It's the term that gives the same direction of force on each side. It's the term that's responsible for one side of the oscillator being a hard spring and the other side being a soft spring. It's the term that gives rise to the coefficient of thermal expansion because as the temperature of a, of a molecule goes up or the bond goes up, the, uh, the atom in the potential well is going to spend more time to the right of the equilibrium position than it is to the left because of that fourth term because it's got a hard spring on one side and a soft spring on the other. Anyway, the third term is what I want to focus on right now. It's the spring constant term. And to get the spring constant, all you need to do is to evaluate the second derivative of the potential at the equilibrium position. Well, we just did that, and we got 15.68 as the spring constant. Now, you remember that the frequency of a spring, of a mass on a spring, is the square root of k over m. So what I want you to do for your project this week is to... Calculate the frequency of an oxygen atom in the Morse potential that we just used. Figure out how many oscillations per second it would execute, or how long the period of one oscillation would be. And then what I'd like you to do is go back to the Morse potential. Calculate the force that it would produce. You can use SAGE for that, or you can use the results that I got from SAGE. You can see what they are right on the screen. And write a Python program to evaluate the motion of an oxygen atom in such a potential for a small oscillation. Give it a small displacement from equilibrium and let it wiggle. Measure the time it takes to wiggle once and compare that to the analytical prediction from the Taylor series. Does that make sense? If everything works, you should get approximately the same period for the full Hoynes method uh, evaluation of the period as you get with the Taylor series estimate of the period. As the amplitude gets larger, the period of the real Morse potential will change. And that's also interesting to see how big can the amplitude get and still maintain a reasonable approximation with the Taylor series, with the first three terms of the Taylor series. All right, have a ball.